Uh-oh, hurricane alert! Everyone's hiding! The speed of the wind outside is more than 75 miles per hour. Seems like a lot. But this storm is moving at 400 miles per hour. Wait, do such speeds exist? Yep, but to see a storm that fast, you'll have to travel to Jupiter. So let the journey begin. The planet is huge. Almost 1,300 Earths could fit into this gas giant. It's also incredibly hot, with the temperatures reaching about 43,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the planet's core. Unfortunately, you can't land on Jupiter's surface because, well, being a gas giant, it doesn't have any solid surface. But you can go deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. Look at these thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds passing by. They're what make the planet look colorful and kind of striped. If you continue descending toward the center of the planet, you'll see its atmosphere, mostly made up of hydrogen and helium gas, becoming liquid. It happens because of immense atmospheric pressure. The planet's core itself is a mysterious object. Scientists still haven't figured out whether it's a molten ball of thick liquid or a solid rock 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. Anyway, exploring Jupiter isn't the main goal of your trip. No, you've arrived here to see the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts are towering more than 5 miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is 1.3 times wider than our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm goes more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. There, the heat reached 2,400 degrees. This temperature is higher than that of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear entirely. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The change in the wind speed is no more than 1.5 miles per hour during one Earth year. It's a tiny change, but however small the difference is, it still means a lot. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. Scientists faced lots of challenges when they were trying to understand the mystery that was the Great Red Spot. It's unclear what fuels the storm. Can it be the nature of the storm's home planet? Since it's a gas giant, Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, so there's no friction, which might be the only thing that could make the storm weaken. The hot gases in the planet's atmosphere are always moving, rising, falling, swirling, just like on our home planet, where cooler and warmer air mix and merge into one another, forming giant circling storms. Astronomers think that once, several enormous storms could have come together and created the Great Red Spot. And now, it keeps going by constantly drawing cool gases from below and hot gases from above. Plus, the storm might be absorbing other smaller vortices. This makes the Great Red Spot even more powerful. Unfortunately, thick clouds on Jupiter don't allow astronomers to see what's going on in the planet's lower atmosphere. Scientists have been speculating on what may hide beneath the Great Red Spot for decades. Is it a massive volcano? Eh, unlikely. Jupiter is mostly made up of gases, and it doesn't have a crust that could crack, letting lava escape from the planet's interior.
A black hole is a place where gravity is so strong that even light can't get out. But black holes can sometimes behave like a massive galactic volcano. From time to time, they flare up. Sounds like me. But instead of spewing lava, they produce enormous amounts of energy. And this phenomenon leaves gaping holes in the surrounding material and gas. A short while ago, scientists discovered one of the largest craters in the universe. Radio and X-ray telescopes detected a supermassive black hole that threw a temper tantrum many, many years ago. It happened in a galaxy cluster about 390 million light-years away from Earth. The crater this event left behind could fit 15 Milky Way galaxies. Yeah, I can't get my head around that either. During your space voyage, think twice before landing on unknown planets. Otherwise, you may end up in a place like K2-141b. That's a planet outside of our solar system. At first glance, it's not that different from Earth. It has liquid oceans that evaporate, form clouds, condense, and get back to the surface as rain. But instead of water, it rains rocks. The surface of this exoplanet is covered with lava seas dozens of miles deep. The temperatures on the K2-141b reach 5,000 degrees during the day. That's toasty enough for the magma in the oceans to vaporize into the atmosphere. Then, supersonic winds, which can move at the speed of 1 mile per second, carry this rock vapor into the planet's night side. The vaporized magma cools down, becomes liquid again, and falls as a rocky rain. Uh Uh-uh, not a vacation spot. Too hot. I'll pass. Picture a tiger. Tigers are known for their beautiful stripes, which they always keep the same. However, imagine if the tiger's stripes could change their size position, and colors from time to time. Magical, right? But that's exactly what happens with one titan of our solar system, Jupiter. Why and how? Well, astronomers might just have the answer, so let's see. Jupiter is a huge and fascinating planet. When you're looking at its picture from far away, it's like seeing a beautiful sunrise. Here we have an entire palette, from creamy pale yellows to caramel browns, with even some blue shades. Jupiter is a fascinating place made mostly of hydrogen and helium, just like our sun. However, it didn't gather enough stuff during its formation to become a star. Instead, it became a colossal ball of gas that could fit more than 1,300 Earths inside. Jupiter has these interesting patterns of dark and light clouds that go around the planet in alternating bands like giant stripes. These dark stripes are called belts, and lighter ones are called zones. Actually, it's not unique in this. 
Earth and Jupiter both have these cool patterns in their atmospheres. It's just that Earth has a few of them, but Jupiter has a lot more. Why are these belts brown and beige? Those can be explained by the combination of hydrogen, helium, and other trace elements in the planet's atmosphere. It's like mixing different colors of paint to create new shades. These belts create beautiful patterns across the planet's surface. Now, because Jupiter has such a massive atmosphere and a weather system similar to Earth's, it experiences some extraordinary storms. So even though these stripes may look calm and peaceful, they're actually part of a wild weather system. It's like a never-ending storm party happening there. These belts and zones move in opposite directions around the planet. The belts go against Jupiter's rotation, like going against the flow, while the zones go with it, joining the dance. And not only do they move in different directions, but they also exist at different heights in the planet's atmosphere. The belts are like regions where things are rising up, like bubbles in a fizzy drink. So the cloud tops in the belts are higher up in the sky compared to the cloud tops in the zones, which are more like sinking areas. So, even though Earth and Jupiter have the similarity, their weather is completely different. It's like comparing apples and oranges. One of the most famous storms on Jupiter is the Great Red Spot. But why is it red? Well, that's a bit of a mystery. Scientists think that the storm sits at a higher altitude than the rest of the atmosphere. This means it gets a stronger dose of sunlight. Imagine standing on a hilltop where the sun shines brighter on you compared to the surroundings. In a similar way, the Great Red Spot gets more radiation from the sun. The storm also contains some special chemicals in its clouds, like ammonia and acetylene. When these chemicals receive that extra radiation, they react in a unique way, giving the storm its distinct red color. It's like a special effect in a cosmic theater. Anyway, the stripes look pretty cool and all. But what's the big mystery around them? Well, you see, one day scientists decided to look at data from deep inside Jupiter, about 30 miles below the surface. And after peeking in Jupiter's secrets, they noticed something strange. When they looked at Jupiter using a special type of light called infrared, the colors of its stripes actually switched around. The light bands that were pale and creamy in normal pictures become dark in the infrared view. The dark bands that were belts before now shined brightly in the infrared. This suggests something interesting. The belts on Jupiter have thinner cloud coverings compared to the zones. It's like the belts are wearing sheer see-through outfits while the zones have thicker clouds like fluffy jackets. So, what we see as dark bands in normal pictures turn out to be bright in the infrared, hinting that these belts have less cloud stuff blocking the light. But here's the most strange part. Every few years, something changes. It's like the weather on Jupiter goes through a wild roller coaster ride. The colors of the belts can change, and sometimes the whole weather pattern becomes a bit crazy for a while. Scientists have been scratching their heads, trying to figure out why this happens. So they've decided to use a special spacecraft called Juno to investigate this. Since 2016, Juno has been gathering a lot of information about Jupiter like a spy collecting clues. One of the things Juno has been looking at is Jupiter's magnetic field. Just like Earth, Jupiter has a magnetic field. It's like an invisible bubble that surrounds the planet, extending to space. This magnetic field is really important because it protects the planet and everything on it. It acts like a shield against harmful particles from space, like those coming from the sun. But Jupiter's way bigger than us so his protective shield is much stronger. Magnetic fields are generated by something called a dynamo, which is like a big swirling conducting fluid inside the planet. This fluid moves around and rotates, kind of like a dance party happening deep within the planet. So scientists have been looking at the data collected by Juno over the years and noticed something interesting. Jupiter's magnetic field has its own little motions, kind of like when you see waves in the ocean. Scientists call these motions torsional oscillations, which is just a fancy way of saying wave-like movements. It's like Jupiter is doing its own magnetic dance. Now let's imagine that Jupiter's insides are like a giant pot of boiling soup. Deep within Jupiter, there are slow currents that carry heat upwards, just like a conveyor belt. This heat eventually reaches the upper part where we see the clouds. But here's where things get interesting. 
Imagine someone starts stirring the soup really fast with a spoon. Those wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, act just like that spoon. They create a disturbance that messes up the slow currents. Now this disruption has a big impact on Jupiter's weather. It's like turning up the heat in the kitchen and changing the way the soup cooks. The patterns of rising and sinking in the clouds, which we call upwelling and downwelling, get all mixed up. A whirlwind in the soup. Our clever scientists also noticed something special near Jupiter's equator. They discovered a concentrated spot of magnetism called the Great Blue Spot. And guess what? This spot is slowing down, like it's taking a break from its usual fast movement. This suggests that a new type of wavy motion, a new dance, is about to begin. So to sum it all up, the scientists have come up with a cool idea. These wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, disrupt the slow currents inside Jupiter, messing up the cloud patterns and causing wild weather. And when the scientists calculated the time it takes for these wave-like motions to happen, they discovered that they match the same time periods when the stripes on Jupiter change. So. In simple terms, the scientists think that these wave-like movements in Jupiter's magnetic field are causing the changes in the stripes on the planet. Pieces of a puzzle are coming together. Scientists are still trying to fully understand why this happens, but it's an exciting step forward in unraveling the mysteries of our vast universe. But there are still some mysteries left to solve. To find more answers, scientists need to keep watching Jupiter closely in the future. By observing how the clouds change, they can check if their theory is correct or if it needs some adjustments. From its massive storms to its colorful belts, Jupiter never fails to amaze us with its cosmic wonders. It may not have ignited as a star, but it shines brightly as a gas giant, captivating us with its size and beauty. So keep your curiosity alive and always reach for the stars. A 40-year-long study has led astronomers to conclude that there's something seriously weird about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system doesn't seem to have seasons. The measurements have been taken both by spacecraft and ground-based telescopes. They showed bizarre weather patterns on the gas giant. For example, cold and hot periods throughout the year, which equal 12 Earth years. And at the same time, Jupiter doesn't go through seasonal changes like our planet. On Earth, weather changes between winter, spring, summer, and fall because of the tilt of our planet's axis toward the plane in which it orbits the Sun. This tilt, which is 23 degrees, allows different parts of the globe to receive different amounts of sunlight throughout the year. But Jupiter's axis is tilted toward its orbital plane by a mere 3 degrees. It means that the amount of sunlight that reaches different parts of the planet's surface throughout its long, long year hardly changes. But the new study has found that there are still certain temperature swings that take place all over the gas giant's cloud-covered globe. Astronomers claim they've solved one part of this puzzle. They've found some hints that such unseasonal seasons might have something to do with teleconnection. This phenomenon describes periodic atmospheric changes in seemingly unconnected parts of the globe, which can lie thousands of miles apart. Scientists have observed teleconnection in the atmosphere of our planet, too. One of the most famous examples is known as the Southern Oscillation. That's when changes in the trade winds of the Western Pacific Ocean correspond with changes in rainfall across large territories of North America. As for Jupiter, when temperatures rise in specific regions of the planet's northern hemisphere, the same latitudes in the southern hemisphere cool off. Further research also revealed that when temperatures rise in the upper layer of Jupiter's atmosphere, called the stratosphere, it gets colder in the troposphere. This is the lowest atmospheric layer where weather events, such as Jupiter's powerful storms, occur. Researchers hope that by measuring all these temperature changes, they will eventually be able to make a more or less precise weather forecast for Jupiter. Maybe in the future, they will even be able to extend this to other gas giants to see if they have similar patterns. But this isn't the only mystery the gas giant can boast. Let's have a look at some other, no less intriguing puzzles. For example, a 2018 study that found that Jupiter had a delayed growth spurt. 
You might have heard that the most popular theory about the beginning of the solar system says that, at first, the Sun was orbited by a dust-filled gas cloud. Some time passed, and tiny pieces gathered together into lumps, which later formed planets. But Jupiter was the odd kid. It started off well. The gas giant was gathering around small clumps of matter for a million years or so. But once it grew to be as massive as 20 Earths, its development suddenly stopped. It could have happened after bizarre zones appeared in space. They emitted so much heat and energy that gas molecules struggled to merge with young Jupiter. This period continued for 2 million years. During this time, Jupiter only grew to 50 times the mass of Earth. But once this stage finished, the planet continued to gobble down gas like before. And soon, it swelled to its current mass, about 300 Earths. Jupiter's most famous feature is the Great Red Spot, a giant storm raging in the atmosphere of the planet and capable of engulfing two Earths. But few people know about the Great Cold Spot. It was spotted only recently when astronomers were checking data received by an observatory in Chile. It's believed that Jupiter's auroras spawned this unusual patch, which is around 400 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the surrounding areas. These auroras are ancient, it makes the spot thousands of years old, and unlike the Great Red Spot, it's not stable. It keeps shape-shifting, and sometimes it almost disappears. But it always returns to the upper atmosphere. Usually it happens after a powerful auroral display. Now storms are no stranger to Jupiter's atmosphere. But where there are storms, there is lightning, right? Yeah, but the bolts of lightning on Jupiter turned out to be very strange. They release radio waves, which is not strange. But for decades, every spacecraft visiting the gas giant managed to record something bizarre. You see, Jupiter's lightning only signaled in the low-frequency range. And no theory could explain why, since lightning on Earth emits radio waves from low to very high frequencies. Finally, in 2018, the Juno space probe solved this mystery. Apparently, the problem was not with the gas giant, but with our technologies. Unlike previous spaceships, Juno had extremely sensitive equipment, and it came very close to Jupiter. So it did record both megahertz and even gigahertz strikes. But even Juno confirmed that lightning on Jupiter was totally different from lightning on Earth. On our planet, lightning avoids the poles. It prefers to zap the equator. Meanwhile, the gas giant's equatorial zone sees no lightning. It lights up the planet's poles. And its peak frequency is 4 volts per second. In 2017, when astronomers were searching for the theoretical Planet X, they noticed that some object outside the solar system was tugging at objects within. Thinking it could be what they had been looking for, they turned a powerful telescope in that direction. Coincidentally, that patch of sky contained Jupiter. And even though the researchers didn't find Planet X, they noticed 10 previously unknown moons orbiting the gas giant. This brought the number of the planet's satellite to a total of 79. But the coolest thing was that one of the newly discovered moons was very unusual. The thing is, Jupiter's moons move in packs. So two of the new satellites were spinning with a group that rotated in the same direction as the gas giant. And the rest was in a cluster spinning against the planet's rotation. As for our weird guy, it was inside the second group but spinning with Jupiter. Unfortunately, it means that the moon will most likely have a short lifespan. An anti-retrograde moon within a retrograde cluster won't be able to avoid a collision. Look at Jupiter's beautiful patterns. Look at these swirls and stripes. For a long time, no one knew the depths of these bands. But in 2018, scientists used a novel way to crack this riddle. This method involved the space probe Juno which orbited the gas giant every 53 days. Each time it passed by, it measured how strong the pull of the planet's gravity was. It helped astronomers create a 3D image of the stripes. It goes like this. The greater the pull, the greater the mass of the region below. And after examining the gravitational map, researchers concluded that the stripes ran shockingly deep. Most of them plunged to a depth of 1,800 miles. 
But Jupiter is a gas world, and the winds raging in its atmosphere shift all that mass around, making calculations very difficult. Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field of all the planets in the solar system. It's 20,000 times more powerful than that of Earth. But the gas giant's magnetosphere is a bit wacky. It's unique and doesn't resemble the field of any other planet we know about. Before, experts thought that Jupiter's magnetic field was similar to Earth's. Two poles connected with magnetic lines near the geographical north and south. But Juno showed that things on Jupiter are a bit messed up. The magnetic south pole is pretty well behaved, but the north pole is a different story. Intensely magnetic ribbons and chaotic pieces of field, some of them without even positive or negative counterparts. Plus, there seems to be another south pole. It might be that Jupiter's hydrogen ocean generates the magnetic field of the planet. And if scientists manage to solve the mystery of Jupiter's magnetosphere, they might also find out what's happening inside the gas giant. But first, they need to understand the bizarre behavior of the planet's poles. Jupiter has 79 known moons, and the four biggest of them that are particularly interesting are Galilean moons. They were named after Galileo Galilei. He discovered them in the 17th century. They have something in common, but at the same time are all very different. Europa is the smallest of the Galilean moons with a diameter of 1,860 miles. It orbits Jupiter every 3.5 days. The first images we got from there were taken in the 1970s. Its surface mostly consists of water ice. Europa has long fractures, often around a mile wide, that can extend for thousands of miles across its surface. They were probably formed as the crust pulled apart from tidal forces on the mysterious ocean beneath the surface. In 2012, scientists discovered water vapor plumes erupting close to its south pole, rising up to 125 miles. These plumes can help us find what's inside Europa without having to land there. Scientists think there could be a magnificent ocean hidden 10 to 15 miles beneath the solid surface. That ocean could be 40 to 100 miles deep. Even though it's just one quarter of Earth's diameter, it contains twice as much water as all of our oceans together. This ocean is a potential environment for some forms of life. Scientists believe the entire ice crust is floating on that ocean. It probably makes a full rotation around Europa once every 12,000 years. In the image the Galileo spacecraft took, you can see small dark brown spots. They're six miles across and formed as the hot, less dense material was getting to the surface. It either pushed the crust or broke through it altogether. The surface of Europa consists of so-called chaos terrains. They're rough areas surrounded by a smoother surface. Its equator could be covered in ice spikes called penitentes that can go up to 50 feet high. We have them on Earth, too, especially in dry areas at high altitudes. But none of them are as big as those on Europa. Our moon has over 5,000 big craters with a diameter of more than 15 miles. Europa's surface lacks impact craters and doesn't look like it's more than 50 million years old. This means the surface of Europa is changing and reforming all the time. This moon is icy and is one of the smoothest of any solid space objects in our solar system. Because of it, it's five times brighter than our moon. Europa is under a constant blast of radiation coming from Jupiter. It's so strong, we wouldn't last even a day there. Europa is five times further away from the center of our solar system than Earth. That means it barely gets any heat coming from the sun so it can remain frozen since the average temperature is negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit at the equator and around negative 360 degrees Fahrenheit at the poles. About 40 years ago, the Voyager 1 spacecraft came close to the rocky moon Io and discovered that it's a volcanic champion of our solar system. Io is Jupiter's fifth innermost moon, 4.5 billion years old, nearly the same age as Jupiter itself. It's similar in size to our moon, and even has a similar density and amount of gravity. 
Many moons in our solar system consist of silicates and water ice. But Io is made of iron and silicate rock. You'd be able to see some beautiful auroras on Io. As this moon rotates around Jupiter, auroras change brightness all the time, but they're always there. Io is relatively close to Jupiter, almost 260,000 miles above its cloud tops. If you could come to Io and take a look at Jupiter from there, it would appear almost 40 times bigger in the sky than our moon. Stargazing there would be amazing! Io needs 42 and a half hours to orbit Jupiter. Our moon needs almost a month. At some points, Io's tidal bulge can go up to 330 feet. It's similar to what we have on Earth. The gravity of our moon causes ocean tides. Io doesn't have an ocean, but the ground itself moves and goes up and down. It's like an elevator taking you to the bottom and then the top of a building with 30 stories. The gravity of Jupiter and its other big moons affect Io, so the solid ground tides on its surface are over five times as high as the highest ocean tides on our planet. All this makes Io so hot on the inside that some of the inner materials melt, boil, and try to escape in any way possible. Eventually, it creates a hole in the ground, which then turns into a volcano. Io is the most active body in our solar system when it comes to volcanoes. Io has more than 400 of those, with 150 of them erupting all the time. Some of them shoot their hot gas plumes 200 miles into space. It would be difficult to walk there, because we're talking about a pretty intense world of floodplains of liquid rock, huge lava flows, multiple lava lakes, and giant collapsing mountains. Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system we know of, also has the biggest water ocean. It's 26% greater than Mercury when it comes to volume, but it's less dense. This giant moon has a thick crust of water ice 90 miles deep. There might be a huge ocean of liquid water underneath. It extends 60 miles deep, which is about 10 times deeper than the deepest point in the Earth's ocean. The Voyager spacecraft also detected polar caps made of water frost there. Ganymede is half rock, half water, including tiny amounts of metals and ice. Its atmosphere is very thin and doesn't contain oxygen. This ocean most likely doesn't contain life. The Earth is a great example of how certain microbes and creatures can survive deep down without sunlight. But the ocean of Ganymede is so deep and the pressure is so strong that the water at the bottom is probably compressed back into ice. Certain forms of life in the deepest areas of our ocean survive thanks to geothermal vents that eject minerals. Since there's likely thick ice between the ocean and the core, this isn't the case with Ganymede. But the ocean there is salty, with multiple layers divided by icy sheets. If there's any chance of life, it could be in the part where the rocky core is in contact with the most internal icy layer. Beneath all that water and ice, Ganymede is the only moon in the entire solar system with a magnetic field. It's possible because this moon has a liquid core. Ganymede circles Jupiter approximately once every seven days. Its orbit is so eccentric that at some points, it's pretty close to Jupiter. Ganymede, Io, and Europa have gravitational forces that affect each other. In the time Ganymede orbits Jupiter once, Europa makes two orbits, and Io makes a full circle four times. One third of Ganymede's surface contains big dark regions, while the other two thirds are lighter. Dark areas are older and contain more craters. Lighter areas have long ridges and grooves about 2,300 feet high and thousands of miles long. Callisto, the third biggest moon in the solar system, 3,000 miles in diameter, needs 17 Earth days to orbit Jupiter. Its atmosphere is very thin. There are many impact craters, but its ancient crust has basically been the same for more than 4 billion years. When a planet is geologically active, like the Earth, some things can erase most of the evidence from past impacts. Water, volcanoes, tectonic plate movements, human activity, and weather. All this changes the surface. Callisto has experienced none of those. 
Scientists think this moon used to be an ocean world that eventually froze over. It was hit by meteors from time to time, but mainly remained untouched. And yet, it still has some pretty impressive craters. Like Valhalla, the biggest multi-ring crater in our solar system that's 2,500 miles in diameter. Major craters on Callisto contain more rings than those on other celestial bodies. Whatever hit the moon was big enough to have punctured the thin crust, causing water to spread on the surface. And under this thin crust, there could be either salty ocean or soft ice. The Galileo space probe detected that Jupiter's magnetic field couldn't penetrate through this moon, likely because of a layer at least six miles thick. That's why it's hard to explore Callisto. Moons like Europa have vents that eject water from the subsurface oceans. But to explore Callisto and discover more about its past, we'd have to use the old school way, digging through the crust. If we wanted to explore the outer parts of our solar system, Callisto would be a great spot because Jupiter's radiation doesn't reach it. So we'd be safer there than on some other inner moons. Imagine leaving your house one morning and seeing not one, but two stars shining in the sky. The first one is our good old sun, and the other is Jupiter. But how has a planet turned into a star? And what will now happen to Earth and its inhabitants? Before we find the answer to these urgent questions, we need to revise some things we know about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system is a gas giant, which means it's made up mostly of gases. Due to the pressure and temperature differences, these gases separate into layers. This creates those red and white bands that can be clearly seen from Earth. The temperatures at the top of Jupiter's atmosphere are insane. They can reach a whopping 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet also has an immense gravitational pull. In 1995, the Galileo probe reached the atmosphere of Jupiter and sliced it at a speed of 106,000 miles per hour. It survived the scorching temperatures and started its descent. It kept moving even when the temperature suddenly dropped and the pressure, as well as the speed of the wind, increased. But 58 minutes and 97 miles into its exploration, things went downhill. The pressure of 23 atmospheres and still high temperatures finished the probe off. It was melted and then vaporized by the extreme heat. Now, if Jupiter suddenly decided to keep growing, it would eventually become a star and its composition would allow this planet to do it. Once, a long, long time ago, Jupiter took most of the mass that was left after the formation of our Sun. That's how it ended up with more than twice the combined material of all other bodies in the solar system. And the planet's ingredients are the same as those of a star, mostly hydrogen and helium. Jupiter is just not massive enough to ignite. But what if it was? Then it would turn into another kind of celestial body, most likely a brown dwarf. In this case, it would have a minor effect on the orbits of the planets of our solar system, because brown dwarfs are more massive than planets, but not as massive as stars. A brown dwarf is usually 13 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter. It can only become a star if the pressure in its core gets high enough to start nuclear fusion. So let's imagine that it's happened, and Jupiter has become a real star. For example, a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars with masses around 7.5% to 50% of the mass of our sun. Red dwarfs are also hotter than brown dwarfs. Their temperature can reach 6,380 degrees Fahrenheit. Our sun, by comparison, has a temperature of almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it means that the newly formed red dwarf will be far dimmer than the sun. And still, red dwarf Jupiter could prevent the inner planets from following their orbits because they wouldn't be able to find a balance between the gravitational forces of the two stars. The planets would move either closer to the sun or closer to the newly formed red dwarf. If Earth chose the first option, our main star's insane temperatures would probably wipe all living beings off the face of the Earth in no time. If it was the second scenario, we'd probably freeze, since Jupiter, as a dim red dwarf, 
wouldn't be able to warm us up well enough. But there could be one more option. The inner planets could get thrown out of the solar system altogether. If Jupiter was a star, it would also greatly increase the amount of radiation the surface of Earth would receive. Our atmosphere would have to protect us both from the radiation coming from the Sun and from Jupiter's radiation. Red dwarfs are notoriously active. That's why Jupiter, just like the Sun, would most likely have frequent coronal mass ejections. This is a fancy expression for describing large clouds of electrically charged particles a star releases with a huge burst of speed. Even now, Jupiter has a significant impact on our planet. The gas giant is roughly 318 times as massive as Earth. And this also means it has an outsized pull on our planet. Its gravity can cause shifts in the orbit of our planet and climate swings every 400,000 years or so. When Jupiter's influence is the strongest, Earth usually has colder winters, hotter summers, and more intense periods of wetness and droughts. Also, if Jupiter turned into a red dwarf, its most prominent feature might probably disappear for good. I'm talking about the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts tower more than five miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is almost twice as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. They were higher than the temperature of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear altogether. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. And now, I have another what-if situation for you. What if Jupiter collided with the smallest star we know about? Today, these two space bodies are on a collision course. A spoiler, Earth might not survive such an encounter. Okay, meet this tiny red dwarf. It's the size of Saturn, and its gravity is around 300 times the gravity of our planet. It normally floats 600 light years away from Earth in a double star system. But today, for some inexplicable reason, it's broken all the laws of the universe and is rushing toward the biggest gas giant in our solar system. And even though this space guest is smaller than Jupiter, its mass is way greater, and its gravitational force soon starts to pull on the gas giant. The heat from the red dwarf, plus its powerful gravity, makes Jupiter grow in size. The planet's atmosphere starts to puff up because the gases that make up the planet begin to heat up and expand. Jupiter's atmosphere starts to leak into space toward the stellar visitor. Sometime later, the runaway gases form a bright hot ring around the red dwarf. This is a terrifying view, as if a black hole, a very bright one, has appeared inside the solar system. The star keeps tearing Jupiter apart, eating chunks of the gas giant. And soon, the red dwarf engulfs it completely. 
Sadly, Jupiter never stood a chance. Instead of the gas giant, we now have a red dwarf surrounded by a ring of hot gases. And we already know how badly it may end. The best thing about it is that this scenario is totally imaginary. Phew, thank goodness. <laughs>